Well, good morning, Lifehouse. If you can have a seat. And all you guests, if there's any here, uh, welcome to Lifehouse. Uh, I can tell that uh, it's the first good weekend of weather. Uh, I think a lot of people are out enjoying that, which I don't blame a lot of people, but I appreciate everybody that decided to show up today, and you are going to be blessed today. Um, I uh, shared with uh, many of you last week that I'm going to take a few weeks off uh, from the pulpit uh, just to kind of decompress and refocus and uh, so that uh, once we get going again, I can have a clear vision of uh, where we need to go, and once in a while, we need to do that. Um, in between that, uh, I'm going to be asking a few of our uh, overseers and uh, um, some of our uh, people people that go to church here, like uh, Brian Young, uh, will be sharing. But uh, uh, today, uh, we have one of our overseers that's going to be here. And uh, uh, Glenn and Tracy uh, Klein are from a small town, Eckley, Colorado. Um, but um, as I've met them over the last year or so, um, I've learned that uh, they don't have small spirits. And uh, after meeting them, um, I uh, have learned that uh, even though we're all, we're all average people, we're all just clay in the, the hand of the potter. Um, the, the thing that we need to do, though, is expand our spirit to receive as much of the anointing of the Spirit of God as possible. And that's what I believe that these two have done over years and years. And uh, not only do they have a great anointing upon them, but they've got great wisdom. Uh, they've uh, uh, been uh, lead pastors at uh, several churches. And uh, I'm not real sure how long you've been in Eckley, but uh, long enough to know your way around church. And uh, I appreciate uh, not only you guys being overseers to this church uh, to protect uh, me, uh, or not to protect them for me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's really one of the, the top thing of our overseers seers do that. If, uh, if I'm up here doing, saying wrong things, heresy, that kind of stuff, um, uh, or uh, I'm immoral or something like that, uh, what happens is our, our elders will call our overseers, they will come in, and uh, they will look what was going on, and they will discipline me, okay? So again, I want you guys to know that there, even though this is a non-denominational church, there is a great covering for you guys to make sure that you guys are um, fully covered with getting the, the true gospel, and we have uh, four overseers right now, and uh, Glenn and Tracy, uh, of course, are, are or one group of them, uh, but uh, um, not only uh, do they um, uh, help you guys, uh, protect you guys from me, but uh, they, they help me as well, and I think, uh, and I'm not saying this that you guys just don't understand my problems, but I, I, I think it's hard to understand sometimes uh, what it is to run a church unless you've run a church before, and that's why it's great to have overseers so I can call them and say, man, what, would you, what, what have you guys done in this kind of situation, and uh, they've, uh, over this past uh, year, uh, they've both been so gracious in, in giving me wisdom uh, to the point of meeting me uh, halfway in North Platte uh, about a month or so ago and actually bought my meal. I, I asked them to come to North Platte. They drove three hours or whatever it was, and, and then they bought my meal. I tried to arm wrestle him, but uh, his arms are really big, so he kind of <laughs> slammed me down. But uh, anyway, um, Glenn, uh, it's, it's great. Tracy as well. It's great to have you two here, and uh, without further ado, can you come up and share the gospel with us? Thanks. Yeah, stay up here, though. Um, let me have this. Okay. Um, you, he didn't know I was going to do this, and so I'm going to ask the only elder I know in this church right now, Stan, but is it okay if I say something publicly? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to anyway. I want you to know that on my watch... I'm not going to allow this pastor, if at all possible, to sacrifice his family at the altar of ministry. And, and I don't know if you know what he's doing in coaching his boys' baseball team, but you only get one chance to do that, brother. And this church is behind you and behind your family, and so we want to pray for you and say you will not sacrifice your family as the pastor of this church. Amen? Amen? Would you stand, please? Extend your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for our pastor. We ask, Father God, that you would give him the great grace, Father God, to walk the balance of loving his family, Father, as Christ loves us. Father, that you would give him the anointing to pastor this church as Jesus would pastor this church, Father, and the anointing, Father God, to walk that line. So, Father, thank you that he has people who watch out for him, People in this church, Father God, that say, not on our watch. We're going to pray for our pastor. We're going to believe God for our pastor. We're going to bless our pastor with our words and our actions, Father. And we thank you for him in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Thanks. You didn't know what you were getting into when you asked me. Come on up here. This is my wife, Tracy. And let me just give you a little bit of history. 
um, she got saved uh, a day and a week previous to, uh, to me and, and began to pray for me. And so if you don't like what happens through my ministry, it is her fault uh, because <laughs> she prayed for me to be this way. And so anyway, I've asked her to come up. What she does, she's kind of the pastoral prayer side of, of our ministry. And so I've asked her, we've agreed that she would just come up and pray for you like she prays at our church. And you can say whatever you want to you. Not that I would be able to stop that, but. Usually, before he starts preaching in our church, I always pray for the congregation and just kind of share if there's something that I'm feeling like that the Spirit is saying. And one of the things that I feel like the Spirit is saying today that he wants to do is that, you know, God is an infinite God. He has no boundaries and he has no limits. And sometimes we try to understand God in an infinite way, in our boundaries. And we, we put little boundaries around God. And when we do that, we really limit him. It's not, he's not, you know, he, we're the ones that put the boundaries on him. He doesn't have any boundaries on himself. So my encouragement today is, as I pray for you and, and as, as Glenn is getting ready to share, is to open up your hearts to God and just say, okay, God, I, I don't really always know the boundaries that I've put on you. But I just choose as an act of my will to, to let those boundaries down. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, just to come and enlarge my understanding and my comprehension, comprehension of who my God is. Okay? Because there, there's times that we don't really understand that, that we've put a boundary on God. It's just the way that, that we have understood him. And sometimes we can't understand God with just our mind. We can't really explain who God is with our mind, but he has sent us the Holy Spirit to, to enlarge our understanding and the comprehension of who God is in our hearts. And when we open up our hearts to God and say, okay, God, if I have a preconceived idea about you, about how you work or whatever, I, you know, I'm just asking that you would remove that from me because I don't want to put boundaries on you. I mean, sometimes we're frustrated with God when it's really us that has done, you know, that has put those boundaries. So I'm going to pray for you guys and, and pray for Glenn as as he goes forward today. But God really wants to have an encounter with you today. He really wants you. He's, he's going to touch your heart in a way that he's never touched it before. If you're willing to open up your heart and allow him to touch you, even if you don't understand it with your mind, okay? Amen. Father God, I just lift Jesus. up these, your people, to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for opening their eyes, for causing them to see you, Father. I thank you for every blinder that is upon their eyes, that they would be removed in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for anointing their ears to hear your voice, and a voice of a stranger they will. Will not follow. I thank you for anointing their hearts, Father God. Holy Spirit, I thank you for kissing their hearts with the Word of God, for enlarging their understanding and their comprehension of who you are, Father God. Father, you know each and every heart here intimately. You know them, and I thank you for encountering their hearts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for transformation in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. Father God, that they will see you with all of your glory, Father, that they will be able to look into your eyes, and they won't just know about you, but they'll have an encounter with you, that they know that they know that you have touched their hearts, that they are changed, that, that you are so real to them. And Father, I thank you that as Glenn does the teaching today, that it's not with human wisdom, it's not with persuasive words, but it's with the demonstration and the power of your spirit, Father God that your word is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it goes forth and it pierces the hearts. I thank you for, I thank you that the blind will see today. I thank you that the lame will walk. I thank you that those that have been held in captivity will be set free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for freedom and healing and deliverance in the mighty name of Jesus, Father. I thank you that your people, your people are free and they see see you in all of your glory in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Isn't she great? Yes. Now you understand. 
Hallelujah. I want to apologize to the tech team. Um, last time I was here, I knew that you all did things with slides and that kind of stuff, and I just kind of forgot and, and uh, didn't get them. So if you're used to seeing it up on the screen, please don't blame them. Blame me. Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get stuff to them in time, and, and so sorry about that. And, and, uh, but I'm sure that you can get it. Out on the table right outside the main doors right here are three series that I brought with me today. What we do is we give this stuff away. If you want to leave an offering, you can. We don't, we don't need you necessarily to, to do that, but, but however it makes your heart work. This one's called The Life Without. Um, this is a series about the ascension, the resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. If you've ever wanted to know about what those things did, this one's for you. There's nine or ten of these out there, um, and, and you can have them. And so, uh, praise the Lord, and, and let me just give these to you. Um, if, you're, if you're faint of heart, please don't take this one. This one is called Shame. Um, this, is, this is a series that identifies when guilt becomes not what you've done, but who you are. That's shame. And when your past and whatever else is who you are rather than what you've done, this talks about how to get free from shame. This is probably, this was an adult Sunday school class in our church, but this is probably a series that, that's uh, been reproduced uh, uh, a pile at, at our church. You can give them away or you can have them, brother. I don't care. Uh, this one's called Vantage Point. When, when, who's doing the study with David? Who was that? Anybody? Was that was a women's Bible study? Somebody like that? Anyway, um, when David looked off of his little porch onto Bathsheba, one version says, and from David's vantage point. And a vantage point is how we see things based on where we are, what our experience has been, what our expectation is, and what we believe. So Vantage Point is about how to mush those things together. And the last sermon in this is called, uh, is called uh, let me look, uh, Conveying Spiritual Sight. It's about how to take faith and turn it into a reality. So uh, you, you, there, there are eight or ten of those out there, and you are sure welcome to have them uh, uh, from as our gift uh, to you in, in, your, in your life. So praise the Lord. All right, if you'd open in your Bibles, please, to the book of, of, of Matthew one of the things Pastor Brett says is he didn't know how long I'd been at a church, and, and uh, this is actually my wife and I's 30th year of ministry, and uh, we've been in two churches, and, and uh, the first one we went in 1986 after traveling for three years. Uh, uh, I've been in every flavor of church you can imagine. I've offended more people than you can count. Uh, uh, prayer groups have been started because of me, and, and uh, so uh, uh, anyway, just... just uh, Kind of buckle up, uh, Buttercup, because here we go. And, and uh, we've been at our present church since 1999. And, and uh, it, it's a great church, literally in the middle of nowhere. There are likely more people in this building than live in the town that is where our church is. And, and our church is around 300 members. We have five uh, staff members. And, and uh, so it's just an unusual thing in the middle of nowhere. And, and you... If you were to drive by and see that, you would ask all kinds of questions like, what possessed those crazy people to build the church there? Uh, how do they get anybody to come there? And the whole answer is, we didn't plan to build it there. God did. We didn't plan to bring people there. God did. And we take no credit for what's happening, and you can't blame us. So it's a church, and Jesus is building the church. Amen? I'm not your pastor. You all know that, right? I didn't come here to pastor you. Your pastor is in the room. It's his church according to God. I came to speak to you today as a part of the body of Christ, and I want to challenge you. So if I get to come to your church very often, the one thing that you'll be able to leave with is um, he doesn't leave much unsaid. That's true. I won't. And, and if, if you're easily offended, who's doing the, oh, you guys are doing the bait of Satan. That is such a great study. You, I don't know if you, you need to buy a rat trap. Okay. The word for offense is the Greek word scandalon. It means the shiny part of the trap where the bait's put. So if you think of a mouse trap or a rat trap, which is what I use, that little thing where you put whatever the bait is, when you touch that, that's called being offended. And if it works perfectly, the little Duma flobby is released when you touch the bait trigger and it cuts off the connection between your head and your heart. Okay? Now, the mouse dies, but spiritually, if you're stuck in your head, 
you're dead too. Because Jesus lives in here, and you've got to get from here to here, and you've got to sometimes get it from here to here and use the mouth gate to make it work. And if you're offended, it won't work. So there you go. Sorry for stealing your thunder, but I could. So <laughs> hallelujah. So today what we're going to do is talk about the forward flow of the Spirit. In every church on the face of the earth, God has a plan for moving that church from point A to point B, actually moving them along the pathway of God's design for them. See, real churches don't just start up because there's a population base and somebody needs a job, right? You don't just start a church so that we can pay Pastor Brett, so we can have a building, and so we can pretend like we're doing something of value. And we can stand up and say, look what we do for God. Churches don't start that way. They start because there's a pathway that God has illuminated. And somebody says, look, look at the light on that path. And they go and they stand on it. And they go, well, look at there. And they start to walk along. And pretty soon, probably what Pastor Brett did, he turned around and people were following him. And he might have been somewhat surprised by that. Most pastors are. And all of a sudden he said, well... I guess that means we should start something. So you move from your church basement or from your house basement into a garage or however this thing got started, you know, and pretty soon you're in another building and now you're in this place. All because there's a forward flow of the Holy Spirit designed for every church. Can you say amen? Okay, so it's not by chance that this church is where it is doing what it's doing the way it's doing it. And by the way, it's not up for a vote. Sorry, Because, here's the deal, if you vote, you will vote based on your comfort, largely. And that won't work. Because the last time I checked, God wasn't taking votes about comfort. He said, come on and be crucified. Now, I don't know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. But I will tell you that if somebody drives railroad spikes through your hands and feet, it don't feel good. And comfort is not how you would describe that. When they poke you in the side with a spear and, post, and, 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 and force thorns of, 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 a crown of thorns into your, into your brow and they spit on you and they pull your beard and they do all that foul stuff to you, comfort is not how you would describe that. Welcome to the world of the Spirit. See, that's how it works. And so it's not personal. They don't look up here and go, geez, you're really, you're really rough. It's not personal, right? Here's your choices. You can live in this world trying to embrace it and at the end you die. Or you can live in this world embracing Christ and at the beginning you die. It's better to die first. Because then, I mean, right? It, it, how many of you, next time you go to a funeral, it's kind of morbid, but anyway, too bad. Next time you go to a funeral, take a Milky Way with you. And when you get there looking over the dead person, pull it out, wave it under their nose, and see what happens. Dead people are not affected. They're simply not affected. I love Milky Ways. Where's that dude that's doing the bike thing? Are you in here? Oh, right. Okay. I have a 25 inch rise Trek hybrid bike, and I ride 17 miles from my house to my office in the morning. I would join your group in a second, and then you and I would race. Because that's what, I just try and keep, I, said, I saw your giants, you know, you got, a, you got a nice bike, and I got a pretty nice bike, and, and, and I'm fairly competitive, and that's the one area I can be competitive in, and so, the other day I was riding, brother, you'd like this. <laughs> Talk among yourselves. <laughs> I was riding the other day on my, on my Trek bike, and I pedaled for a mile and a half at 20, flat ground, 28 miles an hour. Two! <laughs> that's why I beat up your pastor when we went out to eat. <laughs> I'm stronger than him. So anyway, okay, here we go. So we're on this path now, right? And it's not personal. If you die, you're not affected by the world, right? Dead people are cool. See, some of you just got that, right? There's no comfort equation for a dead person. You're dead. It's appointed unto a man to die once. When you accept Jesus Christ, hello, you're baptized into his death. I've already died. When I die, my body falls to the ground. Just put on my death certificate, spirit left. Because I've been dead for a long time. See, dead people aren't affected. So personal opinions and all that kind of stuff, not, not all that important if you're dead. 
So the church operates from a position of dead people. That's why it's not personal. The path has been illuminated by God. Now, there are three basic things that you need to understand about the forward flow of the Spirit. Here they are. Write these down if you're interested. Number one, if there's no recognition of authority, there is no anointing. If there's no recognition of authority, there's no anointing. You must recognize the given authority from Jesus to the under-shepherd, Pastor Brett. You must recognize that pathway of authority. Let me just go one step forward. Further, in the flow of your church, when Pastor Brett has somebody like me come in, an overseer come in, he's lent me his authority for you. He trusts me in that. Okay, now why? He doesn't know me from Sikkim. I mean, honestly. We, we've, we've met maybe a half a dozen times. He, I could be a child murderer for all he knows. But you see, because it's not personal, what he did evidently and what I've done with him is I've just looked at him just like Paul said, I've endeavored not to know anyone according to the flesh. Why? Because his flesh is dead. Right? Why, why notice the decaying part? I mean, honestly, I don't know how many of you have ever, ever done this, but you understand that decaying stuff doesn't smell good. And, and if you're in the world and all you do is pay attention to stuff, that's why people complain. You ever met anybody had a, had a master's degree in complaining? It's because they're really good at noticing the flesh. And it smells, and it makes mistakes. And if you notice people according to the flesh, you're going to complain all the time. Well, I don't like them. Well, what don't you like? Well, and then, you know... You ever notice when people are kind of half embarrassed to tell you what they really think about somebody and they kind of get that swagger going, well, I don't really want to say anything and we really need to pray for this person. But then they launch into a recognition according to the flesh. And they wonder why the church isn't attractive to the world. I, I'm not surprised by that. If we would act more dead and quit judging people according to their flesh, Right? Come on now. We'd quit judging people according to the flesh. See, the church has been so busy telling people what they should and shouldn't do rather than pointing out to them life in Jesus Christ sets them free from the law of sin and death. I'd rather be free than under bondage. It's just simple for me, okay? You can say, well, you know, Pastor, you ought to be doing this. You can just keep your opinions to yourself. They're like noses. Everybody's got one. Just relax. You know, dead people aren't as affected by stuff as you think they should be you got to yell really loud to get a dead person to pay attention. I mean, really loud, right? But can you understand that spirit to spirit, there's a huge connection there. I mean, there is life flowing. Some of you don't know me at all, wonder what in the world I'm doing here, but some of you have already connected spirit to spirit. You're going, oh yeah, what are you saying? I, I can't even put scripture on it. What he's saying is right. Why did you connect? Because there's life, right? The flesh profits nothing. Life is in the spirit. Amen? So you just pick that stuff up. So recognize, hey, Matthew 8, here we go. Are you ready? I'll find it. Verse number 5. So if there is not recognized authority, then there is a limited, or in my understanding, no anointing. Matthew chapter 8. Look at the fifth verse. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. How many of you believe that is not a very good report? Amen? Dreadfully. I, that is the religious way to saying life really stinks for this guy. Dreadfully tormented. Look on. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Isn't Jesus great? Isn't Jesus great? How many of you want Jesus to come to your house? I do too. He ain't coming. He's not coming. Sorry. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed, for I am also a man under authority. Everybody say authority. authority. Having soldiers under me, and I say this one go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. This centurion 
understood, recognized authority and the anointing that happened to be in the word of Jesus went with him and healed and Jesus didn't have to show up at his house. So I say to you again, if you want Jesus to come to your house, you're going to be sadly, sadly disappointed. But if you will take the anointing of recognized authority and say Jesus said it in here, you can take that to your house and fix your problems. Amen? So in the forward flow of the church then, you must recognize the designated authority that God's put in your place. That makes sense? So, and, and now that Pastor Brett has left, I can talk really openly about him. If you have as dessert to your meal on Sundays, flamboyant, flamba- what, do they, what do they call them? Fl- flaming dessert things. Flambe pastor, thank you. Just shout out when you see that I'm struggling. Flambe pastor, you don't respect the authority that God has given you and the anointing will be limited in your life. Now, I know people don't like to hear that kind of stuff, but let me tell you, people come up to me and say, Pastor, why isn't this happening? Well, let's ask a couple of questions. What do you think about the guy who sent, was sent to you by Jesus? Well, I think we ought to get us a different pastor. Well, you're in trouble. You're just in trouble. I'm sorry. It's not going to work for you. Because you see, with recognized authority comes unlimited anointing. According to this guy. And I got other scriptures, but I got to get through this stuff. Okay, so the first one is, if you want your church to move forward in the spirit, there has to be, you have to recognize the authority that Jesus Christ has given you in your church. You don't make him out to be king What you're doing is you're saying, I see that Jesus appointed you and Jesus lives in you and I'm going to carefully follow you while you follow Jesus and I'm going to pay attention spirit to spirit. I'm not going to judge based on the flesh. I notice that Pastor Brett wears blue jeans on the pulpit. Pox on his house, man. He might. I don't know now. I don't know whether or not blue jeans works in the spirit world. Right? And I've never seen a boy in a tie. <laughs> never. He needs to get a tie because if he wants to be anointed, he got to wear a tie. <laughs> I happen to wear this because I like it. It's comfort for me. And by, besides that, I look at myself and I go, wow, you look good. <laughs> okay? You say, do you really say that? Yes. <laughs> I do. Why? Because it's not about what I look like so I can do whatever I want. See, I just hook up in the spirit. You know, Jesus loves me more than you think. Right? I mean, Jesus is flat silly in love with me. And some of y'all thinking that he's trying to figure out how to whack you. He loves me. Just like the little kid song says. Right? He loves me that way. I know that because the Bible tells me so. And if you'll quit making up your excuses about why he doesn't love you, he'll love you that much too because you're in the way. By the way, dead people don't get in the way. I should have brought some of those. I have a, I have a, a, a series of teachings called The Adam's Family, and it's about Adam, sin, and stuff. But we, we played all the, the video, had the little, you know, the, the song they sang, The Adam's Family. Yeah, it's on there. Should have brought some of that. that this it worked really good. All right. <laughs> Second thing you got to have is that you have to understand that some people will refuse to let the Word of God affect what they believe. See, if you're talking about the forward flow of the Spirit, you got to let the Word of God affect what you believe. Don't be coming in here with no preconceived uh, notions about how, well, God doesn't do it that way. I just want to tell you something. God isn't up in heaven validating our belief system by going, yep, they got her right there, that's good. He has his own belief system, and I'll tell you, God never goes against his Word, but he regularly goes against our interpretation of his Word. And sometimes we're just wrong. Amen? I mean, sometimes, I'm telling you, I've been, I've been in churches before, dear Lord, and you just think, now how in the world do these guys find the light switch? I mean, it is just, whoo! And yet God loves them all along, and they had a forward flow of the Spirit. They just weren't where I was. And when I finally learned that, I was able to speak into their life. Because, see, God had a plan for them. So instead of having an attitude about how stupid they were, and by the way, occasionally I crop up with an attitude. I know none of you do, bless your hearts, but I occasionally get an attitude. 
and attitudes are your attempt to place heavenly function and, and, and power on a worldly situation. Okay, When you think your attitude is right and you come at it, even you people trying to convince people of the Scripture, just ratchet back a little bit. right? It's the goodness of God that does this stuff. And I know that your truth is, is, is on a higher plane than mine, but you just need to ratchet back because God is doing some work in Hastings, Nebraska. And He'll do it without us, with us, through it, in between us, and in spite of us. Yeah. So you've got to be willing to remove the refusal of the Word of God affecting your belief system. Your belief system is going to get challenged. And by the way, I'm going to show you that in just a second. It is absolutely common throughout the whole Bible. How many of you know that the church started in the book of Acts? I'm going to show you in just a second that at each turn, they faced recognized authority. At each turn, they, affected, they, they faced the, the, the affecting of their belief system by truth that was not new, but it was new to them. Right? Okay, let's, let's, let's stop and take a little sidebar here for just a second. Do you understand that God is not making stuff up just to confuse you? Right? Just because you've never heard it before doesn't mean God's making it up to confuse you. It's always existed. Right? Truth is universally eternal. Well, that just say amen when you get confused or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Truth is eternal. It's not affected by us. We say it is because we take it, twist it around, make it, make it serve our purpose, and then we say, look what we have. We print it on brochures and we call it tenets of faith and doctrinal truth. And by the way, anybody who attempts to put it on paper is doing a great job and it's wonderful, but you better make it in pencil because God's likely to come to you and say, I need you to adjust here. Right? In our church, we have a jail ministry. I love jail ministry because they can't leave when you're talking to them. <laughs> so you bring them in, you know, and they'll sit there and just listen because they can't go anywhere else and they're so thrilled to be out of their, out of their, their jail cell. And, and, and you know that occasionally when they come to your church, they don't look like they did when they were in jail because in jail, generally speaking, they're all wearing the same clothes. Now, in our particular jail, they wear orange. So when they come out of the jail, they're not orange anymore. And so it makes for an interesting time when they come in and you guys have greeters and that kind of stuff and somebody comes up to you and say, hey, I'm, I'm Stan Ellis and, and I really appreciate your jail team. I was in jail and the minute they say they were in jail and people overhear that, it can affect things. Because where's the jailbird guy going to sit? Well, what if he's dangerous? Oh, he is. You understand that most people who do crime and go to prison hadn't really done a lot of crime previous to that. Look in your row and see which one of the guys is the criminal. How do you know? How do you know that one, two, three guy in a hat here in the third row? How do you? Sorry, buddy, got a hat on in church. You can wear your hat. I'm just teasing you. Okay. How do you know he's not some crazed axe killer? I'm not saying he is. How do you know? How do you know if he didn't just get out of jail? See, if you're judging by the flesh, you're going to look at what he's done, not whose he is. So the forward flow of the Spirit does things differently. It doesn't make any difference if he's been to jail or not. It makes a difference whether he's been with Jesus. I know some of you are going, really? Really? Now, we don't let our jail people just come in and go willy-nilly and teach stuff and do all kinds of stupid stuff. Right? they got to come to our church for six months. they got to have a national background check. We have two unrelated adults in every Sunday school class. We're not stupid. But we're not going to look at him and go, well, because you've been in jail. Listen, I'd like to tell you that if he's been in jail and you're, and you're gossiping, we don't want you either. I mean, if we're going to judge by the flesh, dear God. Sorry, is this too hard, brother? Okay, if you, you know, if, if I'm stepping on your toes, get them out in the aisle, I'm coming by. 
Do you understand that this stuff is serious, serious, serious? Because God is doing eternal work in the lives of people. And we're so wound up about what we think it's supposed to be about. I have a double murderer that's assigned to me in our prison ministry. He killed somebody, shot him in the, two peoples in the back of the head. He's going to die in prison. One of the most redeemed people I've ever met in all my life. You say, how do you know that? Because I quit judging him according to the flesh. Because initially, when I found out, and he's following me around in the prison. <laughs> right? I mean, yeehaw! Three of the five guys that are signed to me are murderers. Now, you can do one of two things here. You can think that the prison hierarchy is trying to get rid of me. That's possible. <laughs> By assigning murderers to me and turning and looking the other way. Or God knows that I'm not going to judge those guys according to the flesh. Therefore, my class, my ministry is safe. And I choose the second one. Why? Because, you see, it's not about what you've done. It's about who you've met. Right? Come on. Amen. Third thing. So the first one, recognize authority, brings anointing. Second one is you've got to stop refusing to allow what the Bible says. More specifically, the New Testament in particular says, because that's where God reveals what he'd always been thinking about. Okay? The New Testament is the end all. Because in the Old Testament, they had trial and error almost. Sacrifice this bird, see if that works for you. And we proved that we needed a singular sacrifice called Jesus to put an end to blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we needed that to happen. Right? And so Jesus solved the problem. So then you read the New Testament, you go, hey, look at here. This has never happened before. We've never seen this before. But it's not new truth. It's just new revelation. Right? So we put that. Okay, third thing. Throughout biblical history, whenever God changed a life, <coughs> excuse me, whenever God changed a life, he affected their mouth. He affected their mouth. Take that from your salvation experience and go backwards. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Throughout history, when God changes a life, he affects their mouth. You confess with your mouth. The word confess there is a Greek word, homo logos or homo logio. Okay? So if you're real good at this and you love this, logo or logos is, is word. Homo means same. Okay? Same word. So if you confess what God says, you shall be saved. Not what man tells you. I want to tell you something. Those of you who walked an aisle to get saved, congratulations, but the aisle didn't do it. Okay? It's confessing Jesus Christ because the Word said that. Not because our church believes that, you know, or it, it's not about us, right? Dead people make very few rules. Making sense, isn't it? That's, I, I love to talk about dead people. Not because I'm, not because I'm crazy, but because everybody relates. My first, my first, you guys will remember this. My first funeral was an 18-year-old suicide victim. They don't really teach seminarians and all that. They don't really teach how to do that. And so I decided one day that, that I'd just go to the mortuary and hang out, which now sounds really weird, <laughs> while they had visitation because I didn't know the kid. And people came in. And, and they, the high school kids come on and lean over him and say things to him and beat on his chest. And he never moved, not one time. He wasn't affected by their tears. He wasn't affected by, by, by their discouragement and his choices. He wasn't affected by that at all. And I'm lightning quick. Okay, I mean, I'm real, I got it going on. I, I'm lightning quick and I go, there's a spiritual principle here that's fairly important. Dead people don't respond. That's a pretty good spiritual principle. Dead people don't respond. And I went, okay, God, help me to develop that. Because see, <laughs> once you're dead, nothing else matters. Right? Once, now, you say, now, you got to remember, will you listen with your spirit, man? Quit thinking I'm talking about real dead people. I'm talking about you as a dead person. Right? When your 
spirit man is crucified in Christ, and it's no longer you that lives, but Christ who lives in you. Are you getting that? That changes things. So <laughs> when that happens, God changes your tongue, changes your mouth. So the forward flow of the Spirit is released by that recognized authority. It's released when you stop refusing to allow the, the Bible to affect what you believe. Many people will say, you know, now I don't know what your church is and it doesn't really make any difference, but our church is charismatic, meaning that we like modern day uh, uh, church music and, and we love the drums and all that kind of stuff that you guys like. And we would probably be also be called a Pentecostal church. So we embrace the, the, the notion that, that the gifts of the Spirit are still functioning today since God said he'd never change. If he talked about it once, he's probably still doing it. Again, real simple mind I have. <laughs> and so I don't really care whether you believe that or not. It's in the book. It's life to me. In fact, the Bible says, you know, when God affects your mouth, he'll show you a few things. So anyway, I, I don't want to go down that road because if I do, I'll get, get lost. So Acts chapter 2. Let me show you this, and I'll get as far as I can in this. <clears throat> but I, I just challenge you to understand these three things and then apply them to your church and to your life. That, that, that recognized authority has a lot to do with the anointing. That, that allowing the Bible to affect what you believe has a lot to do with this. And throughout history, God changed people's mouths when he dealt with them. You may remember in the book of Joshua, thank you, Lord. It just, it just real, he, he said, meditate on these things. Don't let them depart from your mouth. You think that changed his mouth? You may remember in the book of Isaiah that, a, that an angel flew to him with tongs. This is the greatest picture. It's an angel and he's using tongs. Was he affected by the heat? What's the deal? See, it's one of those really neat mysteries in heaven that he picked up some salad tongs and picked up a coal of fire from the throne of God. Which, by the way, those of you who think it's really golden and all that kind of stuff, I don't know how hot gold has to be, but he had some of it in them fancy tongs of his. And then, to show you how Isaiah had to be kind of dead for our purposes today, he put that in that guy's mouth. Think that affected him? I'm thinking it did. Angel flew up with a molten glob of something and go, oh, here, this will be good for you. <laughs> Changed his mouth. Guaranteed. Anybody ever done that? I, I used to weigh quite a little bit more than I weigh today. And uh, I, I used to be a, a, a pizza buffet nightmare. Anybody ever done that where you went out to the pizza buffet and you watched and they put out a brand new, brand new hot pizza? You went, oh, i got to have some of that. And you put it in your mouth too soon and the cheese stuck to the top of your mouth. And you're going, ah, ah, you know, and, and your head is shaking and stuff. Can you imagine what happened to Isaiah when they stuck the heaven hot in there? You think that changed him? I'm guessing it changed him. Ezekiel had a great thing. Ezekiel, God came to him, and, and Ezekiel said, yes, Lord. He says, I'm going to come inside for just a second. And he went inside and spoke through Ezekiel. I'm telling you, that changed his mouth. And then he showed up again and gave him a book to eat. He ate a book. And he said it tasted like honey. Now, those of you delinquents who have ever shot a spit wad, <laughs> paper don't taste like honey. It changed his mouth. Amen? God, see, that's what God does. He changes your mouth when he deals with you. It's real good. I love it. I love it. Paul said, I believed, therefore I speak. First or Second Corinthians 4 and about 13. or Second Corinthians 4 and 13 is exactly right. Go look it up. You can test me. All right, Acts chapter 2. Let's look at this. So you got these three principles? Look what he does. First church begins in Acts chapter 2. Look on verse number 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men. Now these are people who have a belief system that is about to get challenged. These guys who came out of the upper room praying in unknown languages, who were uneducated and untrained men, we have devout Jews. Can you see the, can you see the collision coming? Right? And so these guys showed up and they're, and they're devout. Now, what devout means is they followed all the rules. And they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna break some rules here. Old rules, right? New relationship. 
when, when God breaks a rule that you hold on to, He'll do it through relationship. That's good, isn't it? Some of you, some of you get that like tomorrow, the next day, you go, oh yeah. I just had a brand new granddaughter. I didn't have her. My daughter-in-law, her name is Ava. She's three weeks old. She was at my house last night, two nights ago. She's three weeks, two, three weeks old. Three weeks old. She's so precious. Did you know I loved her before I saw her? I had a relationship with her. And did you know this, that I think your kid looks like a drowned rat? But my baby was hurty. Relationship changes stuff, doesn't it? Are you getting it? So when God takes a rule, I mean, I, I, I sorry, I was this way. My wife knows this, you know. I, I try not to say really uncomfortable things, but people bring their baby by, you know, and they're real proud of it, and they got them disformed heads because the doctor grabbed it with the tweezers and pulled it out, you know, and, and I'm just thinking, dear God, I hope that head rounds out, you know. <laughs> hope you grow a lot of hair so your sticky out ears don't show, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But then when you have relationship, it changes things, doesn't it? So you see, you got to understand how this stuff works. Relationship changes things. So when you have a, a rule in your life, God will give you a relationship to challenge it. Because you see, the rules of... <clears throat> did, did, did you know that my kids could never write on the windows of my car? Remember when the windows get all fogged up? It was when my kids were growing up, you could lose a hand writing on my windows. Do you know that my grandchildren draw pictures on my windows? And my kids look at them and go, we couldn't do that. I said, yep, relationship changes stuff. <laughs> I had rules before. Now, these are my grandchildren. They can do anything they want. Come to Papa's house. Right? It's it. Come on, grandparents. You with me? It just changes things, doesn't it? So you got to understand those things. So these guys had some rules, and they're getting ready to meet somebody, and it's going to change based on a relationship. So all three of these areas are going to be challenged. Look what it says. <clears throat> Devout men from every nation, verse 5, under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused. Yep, that'll happen. You understand confusion happens when what you once believed is now challenged by something. You go, wait a minute. Whoop, wait. Well, I thought it was supposed to be this way. Right? I mean, there are all kinds of natural examples of this. Came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Can I tell you that Pentecost, those of you who wonder about that whole speaking in another language thing, do you understand the miracles in the hearing, not in the speaking? <laughs> That's a pretty good revelation too. Everyone heard them speak in his own language. It was the miracle of hearing. And what did they hear? Look over verse number 11. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They were changed by a recognition of authority, something unusual happened. The Holy Spirit sent tongues of fire down and stuff happened. And they went, wait a minute, this is different than the way it used to be. And they had to let the Bible get in the way of what they believed. And then it changed their mouth. In the forward flow of the Spirit, that will always, always, always happen. Look at the 29th. Man, let's go a little further than that. 32nd verse of chapter 2. <clears throat> Look at 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we were all witnesses. See, so he's been, this is the first preaching. Do you know that preaching changed? When the forward flow of the Spirit came in, in, in forming the church, preaching changed? Look at the 36th verse. <clears throat> Therefore, let all the house of Israel, uh oh, uh oh, religion as we knew it is now going to be challenged. Whole house of Israel, no, assuredly God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter, now notice that when these guys got their belief system challenged, they ask a question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, you shall accept the authority that God's put in here. You shall allow the Bible to change what you believe. And you shall let the Bible and the truth that you get change the way you talk. That's what happened here. And the church changed the face of the earth at that moment. Now, since God doesn't change, 
Let's, let's, let's just extrapolate this out as far as we can. Since God doesn't change in this church, this formulation that God made called the church changed the face of the earth, can you have any idea what God is going to do through a little church called Lifehouse in Hastings, Nebraska? Talk among yourselves till you come up with an answer. If God did it then and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't it great the effect that dead people can have on the world? But see, many of us, we won't, let, we won't let what the Bible says challenge our belief system. Well, how could God use someone like you? I have the same questions. I am absolutely astounded every time God uses me. Because I'm like you. I look at myself except when I'm, you know, ly- lying, you know, to myself when I gave up all my bad habits. Except for my lying. But anyway, um, <clears throat> you understand that God chooses to work through you, right? In spite of who you think you are. See, I love that. I love when God shows up because I know who he is and I'm not him. So it's real easy. Amen? Let's keep looking at this. So, oh, I didn't give you the answer. What did he say to him? Verse 38, repent. What is repent? It means to kind of turn and go the other way. Say the things that God says about you. Jesus came to fix me. Turn and go the other way. Be baptized. Well, wait a minute now. I don't have to be baptized. I don't believe in being baptized. Well, let the Word of God get in the way of what you believe. Right? Every one of you, in the name of Jesus. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No way. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Wait a minute. Am I going to receive the gift, preacher, that I just saw in there? Why? Don't you want it? Don't let the Word get in the way of what you believe. No, I don't want it. That's the craziest. You know, I've heard that stuff passed away. Of course it did. That's why it says God changes all the time, makes up random rules as he goes along. God never changes. The Bible says that. If he did it then, I'll just tell you, healing's available today. And by the way, I don't have answers to all your questions. Okay? I just know what God's answer is. I don't. Let me give you one more so we can go, and then Ryan's going to come up here. And... Chapter 3. Let me, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you getting, you know, the whole purpose, as I prayed about coming to your church, the whole purpose was to show you that there's a path that you guys are on, and that path is, is either, either fulfilled or hindered by your acceptance of some of these things. The anointing, the, the recognized authority that God gives you, the, the understanding that you've got to let the Bible challenge what you believe, and that you've got to allow God to change your mouth. Now, don't make this into some Pentecostal thing. Some of you talk like sailors on Monday. Okay? you got to let that have an effect on your mouth. Change the way you talk. Right? Some of you change the way you talk just by the people you're with. Don't do that. Be a Christian every day. Speak the word every day. Amen? Okay, chapter 3. Oh, anyway, in every chapter, so that you can study, because I'm out of time, you can study this in every chapter in the book of Acts, clear up through chapter 6. There's an example of this, where God challenged what they believed, gave them an accepted authority to submit to, and affected their mouth. Look at chapter 3. Peter and John went up to the temple, the hour of prayer. Notice they were still doing what they knew to do, but God was getting ready to change their whole prayer life. Then the hour of prayer, like 9 o'clock in the morning, they went to pray because it was supposed to. How many of you know you don't have to pray at 9 anymore? It won't hurt you, but you don't have to. Right? No, you don't have to come to the church at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and pray. Unless you want to. Certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on them, John said, look at us. Now, if he doesn't recognize the authority of this man who's speaking, he won't look. Right? Have you ever been in a crowd? where you saw somebody who was facing this way and they said, hey, and you were over here and you turned around to see if somebody was speaking to you so you could recognize the authority potentially of who was doing the hollering. Right? I mean, is that how it works in your world? How it works in mine. Look at us. So he gave them his attention expecting to receive from them. Notice that he expected to receive. 
Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have. Did you notice something? He owns something. He took ownership of something. This is different. This is different than the Old Testament. This is different than church in general. He owned something. He says, what I do have. What did he have? Recognized authority. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. By the way, that guy recognized the authority. The anointing was ramped up and his crooked feet were straightened. And in the verses to come, the people said, why do you look at us as if we did this? This is what happens when the name of Jesus is trusted. Amen? Amen. Ryan, would you come with your team, please? I hope, I hope, I hope that this makes sense to you, and I hope that it has a lasting impact in your church. The forward flow of the Spirit is so important for a church. Do not get stagnant here. Find that flow and stay in it. And allow God to challenge what you believe. He may just confirm that what you believe is right, but allow Him to challenge it through His written word. Not what somebody else says, not even what I say. Through His written word. Cast your own eyes on it, put your own fingers on it, and say, look what it says. And it'll change you forever. And it'll change the way you talk. Amen? Stand with us, will you please? Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank You for the anointing that rests in Your word. We recognize the authority of the Holy Spirit to speak it into us, Father. And we are grateful to you in Jesus' name for all that you do. And everyone said, amen, amen. Thank you, brother.